Kajuntif, everybody. Some of you know that I just celebrated a big birthday. Uh, exactly two weeks ago, I turned 50. Um, that might not sound like such a big birthday to some of you. <laughs> but it's the biggest one I've ever had. So. Um, so now that I'm past that milestone, I'm doing my best to celebrate the fact that, like our beautiful synagogue building, I am officially mid-century modern. <laughs> During most of my adult life, my birthday hasn't felt terribly important to me. I've never felt especially excited to celebrate them. Even the big ones never felt particularly meaningful. It's not that I was depressed about them or hated getting older or any of that. My birthday just never really felt like a big deal until this year. This one, though, was different. It felt weightier, more serious somehow. For whatever reason, this birthday was the one that drew me into deeper reflection about who I am and where I am in my life and where I hope to be in the future. And like for everyone who undergoes that sort of introspection, I'm sure that reflection was reassuring at times and others at others completely depressing. You know, Albert Einstein published his first paper on relativity when he was 26. He had a Nobel Prize by the time he was 42. Beethoven wrote his fifth symphony when he was 37 and mostly deaf. Isaac Newton invented calculus when he was 23. He invented calculus <laughs> when he was 23. I realize that my life's accomplishments will never include similar masterpieces of art or science, but I still can't help but reflect on whether somehow I could be doing more with my time. Maybe you do the same at this time of year, wondering about how much time is left, how many more years, how many more days or hours remain for you to leave a lasting mark on the world. So I did a little math on my birthday. Today, the global average human lifespan is 4,576 weeks. As of today, tonight, Kol Nidre night, I have lived 2,618 weeks. So by careful subtraction, I have 1,958 left to go. And then I did more math, and it turns out that actually I probably have a bit less than that because life expectancy in America is lower than in other developed nations, and it's lower for men than it is for women. American men can only live to expect to live about 3,957 weeks, which means that after I subtract the 2,618 I've lived through, there are only 1,346 remaining. 1,346 weeks left to me. 1,346 Shabbat dinners, 1,346 Sunday mornings with coffee and the crossword, just 1,346 weeks left. By Simchat Torah, another two will have vanished. By Hanukkah, nine more. There's a company online that sells customized posters for your wall. The posters are covered with a tidy grid of little circles, rows and rows and rows of tiny round bubbles. Each bubble represents a week of your life, and the idea is that you color in all the weeks you've lived so you can see clearly how many empty bubbles, how many weeks you have left. So the chart shows 4,000 weeks in all. The grid's 52 bubbles wide, so each line represents a year of your life. And on my chart, there are about twice as many bubbles filled in as there are empty ones. All that's left is a couple dozen rows of empty circles, just about 1,300 weeks. 1,300 little bubbles left to be filled in, and that's all. I know it's no great insight for me to 
observe with you that the days of our lives are limited. The awareness that we're living on borrowed time is sprinkled all throughout Jewish text. The days of our life pass by speedily and we are left in darkness, the psalmist writes. Vanity of vanities, exclaims Ecclesiastes, all is emptiness. The earth remains, but generations come and go. All our life's breath is just a briefly swirling current of air that vanishes instantly. This theme is a constant rhythm beating steadily under almost every piece of Jewish text. Time is running out. The prayers on Yom Kippur underscore this truth too. They urge us to change our ways quickly. We have to hurry, not because of God's impatience, but because of our own fragility. The stakes are unimaginably high because we're navigating through time inside finite, vulnerable bodies. We feel the hold of mortality tighten on us with each passing year. Our joints dry and creak. Rogue cells mutate and explode in flurries of cancerous reproduction. The heart, that noble fist of muscle clenching and unclenching through all our days, will sometime or another grow exhausted from its labor, will stutter and fail. To be a human in a human body means to be susceptible to all the mysterious and painful inevitabilities that come with it. Reminders of this hard-edged fact run throughout the entirety of this awesome and terrifying day. We drape ourselves in our Torah scrolls in white, both to represent the purity of repentance and also to evoke the paleness of a funeral shroud. It's said that when we remove the scrolls from the holy ark, its emptiness is meant to resemble an open casket. We stand before it when Kol Nidre is chanted, and it is as if we are peering into our own coffins, contemplating our own ends. Who shall live and who shall die is blunt and it is cruel, but it is not a lie. Any of us who serves this pulpit can testify to that. We stand here and we watch from one year to the next as beloved faces disappear from those pews. This one who reached the ripeness of age and that one taken before his time. This one in wealth and that one in poverty. This one whose casket is attended by throngs of weeping mourners and that one lowered into the earth with no one to bid her farewell. On Yom Kippur, we are visitors in the land of the dead. Like Persephone groping her way through the shadowlands, we shuffle along refusing ourselves the food and drink of mortal creatures, desperately praying that we will be allowed back to the world of the living, holding a year's worth of regrets like pomegranate seeds, bright as gemstones glistening in our palms. And most years, our prayers are successful. We are inscribed in the right book. We go on to another year of life but it won't work that way forever for any of us. All the world's great literatures hold stories about the human quest for immortality and everyone ends in failure. There is no escape from immortality and Judaism stares this reality starkly in the face, refusing to be comforted by other faiths ideas about heavenly paradises or cycles of reincarnation beyond the grave. Judaism affirms that life, like all precious commodities, would lose its value if it were to become unlimited. But we can't help but wonder, what of us will endure? And we can't help but shiver when we realize that given enough time, the answer is probably nothing. Given enough time, not only will our names vanish, but Everything we have done, every act of kindness and cruelty and carelessness, no matter how we yearn to leave behind something of substance, a successful business or a monument to our leadership, 
mountains of fortune and possessions, lists of creations and accomplishments, how long could they last? If the answer were revealed to us, it would likely break our hearts. When I was in Israel last summer, I participated with our students in an archaeological dig, and I found this little shard of pottery. It's a, a broken fragment of an ancient pot that was shattered centuries ago. The piece was too small and, and too insignificant to be of any value, so the archaeologist let me take it home. From time to time, I look on the inside of this piece of the pot, and I can see here the ridges formed by the potter's slender fingers. And you can still see them clearly some 2,000 years after she made them. More of her remains in this piece of clay than anything that will survive from my work 2,000 years from now, and it is desperately humbling. These days of awe want us to produce different kinds of artifacts, though. Good deeds and acts of generosity, humility and repentance, the families we raise, the friends we care for. They won't last forever either, but the time we spend with them matters in a way we can't quite explain but can't quite ignore either. If those are the relics we'll leave behind to outlive us, we should be thoughtful and deliberate about how we spend our time nurturing and cultivating them. So again, we're back to the problem of our limited and rapidly diminishing supply of weeks. What shall we do with them? How exactly shall we go about filling them in the most efficient way possible? Is there a productivity method, a clever technological tool or technique that could help us make the most of our fleeting time on Earth? If we could be more productive, maybe we could do more with the dwindling number of days we have left. A couple of months ago, the New York Times published an article about the growing trend of worker surveillance. And they found that a staggering number of America's largest employers use technology to record and analyze virtually every minute of their employees' time at work. Keystroke loggers and surreptitious webcams to optimize worker productivity and make sure they're not wasting company time. But in a shockingly large number of cases, there is no evidence at all that it results in better employees producing higher quality work. Instead, when productivity is taken to this obsessive extreme, it leads to lower morale. It breeds mistrust between colleagues and creates uniquely soulless and unsatisfying workplaces. We're in this era of measurement, said one executive, but we don't know what we should be measuring. What a great question for Yom Kippur. What should we be measuring? And what do we do with that information when we have it? When we're faced with the inconvenient truth of our mortality, we're tempted to try to cram as much as possible into our remaining time. But according to Oliver Berkman, an expert in time management and productivity, this is exactly the wrong approach. When time is scarce, he says, we should work on clarifying what we will not do. Because our world is full of vast possibility and we will never come close to doing it all. We have to decide what we will say no to, and this will include saying no to some things we'd very much like to say yes to. Every choice we make about what we will do represents a value statement, an expression of principle about what matters most. The unfilled weeks that lie ahead of us are not an invitation to heightened productivity, but heightened selectiveness about how to fill them with things that will make our deeds kinder and our lives more honorable. We're told that human beings were God's crowning achievement, but what a peculiar prize we are, a soft-skinned primate that knows it's going to die. Even worse, we have brains that are fiendishly clever at distracting us from the awareness of our limited time on Earth that lead us instead toward things that feel safer, infinitely long lists of TV shows to watch, infinitely deep streams of social media to scroll, infinite catalogs of music to listen to, 
The brain knows that all it has to do is help us waste enough time that the despair will subside and we'll forget how little time we have left. But the awareness of our mortality is a powerful tool with which we can crack open an energizing new appreciation for how to spend our time. The trick is not to recoil from the knowledge of our finitude, not to distract ourselves from it, but instead to draw it close, like a fearsome dog at the end of a leash that can protect us from worse dangers out in the dark. When I set out to write a sermon about my 50th birthday, I didn't expect that it was going to turn out to be quite so much about the inevitability of death. <laughs> but writing these words has turned out to have been an unexpectedly valuable birthday gift. It drew me into contemplation and goal setting, thinking hard about the road that led me here and about where I hope to find myself in the future. I started keeping track of how many of my weeks I've used up and planning for the 1,346 that I likely have left to me. I can watch them go with a kind of sweet nostalgia, imagining them popping like champagne bubbles as they disappear one by one. Teach us to number our days, the psalmist writes, so that we may acquire a heart of wisdom. That's why we count them so we can nourish the heart and build up some measure of wisdom that, who knows, may last. We and everyone we love and everything we know are brief winks of time in an inconceivably vast universe. None of us knows how much time will be given, but for all of us, it is running out faster than we might like. There's no great secret about how to fill these days best except to cultivate the things that we want most to survive in the world after we're gone. Love, kindness, forgiveness, and humility. Focusing on those things is not a way of avoiding real life. Those things are the realest part of life. They're the truest core experiences of our human years on earth. Yom Kippur unlocks a powerful liberating paradox that only after we accept the unavoidable truth that we will not live forever are we freed to build the kind of legacy that might endure. None of us can guarantee how we will be remembered after we're gone, but today we plan, we imagine, we promise to start living like the kind of ancestors we want our descendants to have had. If there is an error we need to correct, if there is a wrong for which we must atone, if there is a kindness we have been waiting to acknowledge, the time is now. We cannot wait forever, and there is precious little time left. Our lives are absurdly brief and insultingly fragile, and this great and terrible day will not let us forget it. Today, we're surrounded on all sides by reminders of our mortality, surrounded by the sudden awareness that even when we're not paying attention, the weeks of our lives are filling up and falling away, one after another after another. But mortality's curse is also its blessing, because as we watch them go, we gain access to the rare and precious realization that the scarcity of time is precisely the thing that allows us to number our days that we may acquire a heart of wisdom. So my friends, my dear, sweet, mortal friends, as we make our way into this day of awe and into the unspecified number of days ahead, may they bring us goodness, may they bring us light, may they deliver peace, and comfort, and may all of us be inscribed for good in the book of life. Amen.